people are inherently very uncomfortable with the idea that a single nobody can have such an effect on all of our lives. It's more comforting, he said, to believe that powerful you know, groups of people or conspiracies are actually running things, even if you think those powerful groups are nefarious. It's somehow comforting to think that somebody's in charge, that it's not all just random, you know, that a plane couldn't just drop from the sky and land on your house tomorrow. And I thought about this when I was thinking about, you know, someone, if somebody had asked you a question, who was the most important figure in the past hundred years in terms of why the world has gone the way it did, you know, you would think of all these famous people whose names almost anyone who's halfway educated would recognize. And yet what's interesting is you could conceivably put the name down of somebody who was, historically speaking, you know, a nobody. Lee Harvey Oswald on the pages of the history books besides the Kennedy assassination is a nobody. He didn't do anything else of importance. But that event was huge, right? If he actually killed John F. Kennedy the way the narrative says, Lee Harvey Oswald changed the world. He changed the president instantly, right? I mean, how many of us have the potential to change who the president of the United States is? That lone gunman did if he was indeed the lone gunman. The person who may be most responsible for the modern world, this entire world, including the 9-11 attacks that, you know, many commentators now say shape the modern world, right? We live in an era of terrorism or the age of terrorism, you will hear them say, without them seeming to really understand that the age of terrorism supposedly sparked by the 9-11 attacks in the very, very, very early 21st century were themselves manifestations of an act of terrorism that launched us into the 20th century. If we actually live in an age of terrorism, as some of these people like to say, we've been living in it for more than 100 years. I think you could make the case that the most important individual in the last century is Gavrilo Princip. And Gavrilo Princip is a name very few of you will recognize. How can a person of so little achievement, you know, on the world stage, be perhaps credited with creating the entire world around us? I mean, if, if Gavrilo Princip doesn't live, is there a 9-11 attack ever? And if that was all he did, wouldn't he be important? He did a lot more than that. Gavrilo Princip is the reason there was a Second World War. Because Gavrilo Princip is the reason there was a First. And to be fair to Princip, if you could have gone to him and shown him the ramifications of what that one day uh, would do to the world, I, I think he'd be horrified. He wasn't trying you know, to unleash a global world war. He just became the latest example of someone pulling the trigger in a giant historical game of Russian roulette. A trigger that had been pulled several times already with nothing, you know, happening. Who would have thought that the time that Princip pulled it, that would be the time that the, you know, metaphorical revolver pointed at the skull of the old world shot a bullet into its brain? Perhaps... Princip and his compatriots would have thought that, you know, sometimes when you're trying to create a new world, you have to utterly destroy the old one. And the people in that old world were not naive about the potential for someone like a princip to do what they did. I mean, Otto von Bismarck, one of the greatest diplomats of 19th century Europe, perhaps the greatest diplomat Germany ever produced, famously said that if there was going to be some giant global conflict, it was going to probably break out because of some damn fool event in the Balkans. Gavrilo Princip shot two people in the city of Sarajevo, smack dab in the Balkans, a place that Otto von Bismarck had famously said was not worth the bones of a single Pomeranian grenadier. It would cost a hell of a lot more than that. And Princip becomes yet another example in history, proving to us that Sometimes when it comes to something like terrorism, in this era, by the way, when we try desperately to keep weapons of mass destruction out of the terrorist hands because we're afraid they'll be able to kill more people with such weapons, we forget that sometimes it's not about how many people you kill. Sometimes it's about 
who they are. And often, it's not the terrorist act that changes the world. It's the response of the victims, you know, that does. Gavrilo Princip killed two people, and he did so in a way that almost makes you believe in fate. And truthfully, I'm not much of a fate believer, but one of the things I like about history is how it forces me to challenge some of my own preconceptions and certainly make me think about other possibilities. I've always thought, for example, that history unfolds for chaotic reasons. You know, that it's somewhat random, that millions of people going about their lives in their own ways with trends and forces acting upon them and people in important positions making decisions and all this together creates a dynamic that's completely unpredictable, as I said, somewhat chaotic and random, and unfolds into the future. I think my logical side of the brain appreciates that sort of viewpoint. The problem is, is that sometimes history confronts us with events where the logical part of at least my brain wants to flip sides and wants to logically defend what I consider to be the more illogical point of view. In this case, the logical part of my brain will sometimes shift and try to defend something like fate or destiny or predetermination. Those to me are the two ends of the scale, chaos on one side and randomness on one side and fate and predestination on the other. And there's this weird twilight zone where the two sort of intersect. And that event that happened in late June 1914 is one of the best examples you'll find from history where, you know, the, the logical side of your brain stands a pretty good chance of flipping and trying to defend the illogical position that this is somehow predestined. I mean, let me challenge you with a similar kind of analogy. Take the John F. Kennedy assassination, for example, and imagine that in addition to Lee Harvey Oswald up at the Texas School Book Depository, you have a, another assassin on the grassy knoll, as has sometimes been suggested, and that in this JFK assassination attempt, Oswald misses, and the bullet strikes the ground, maybe injures some passers-by, and everybody realizes an assassination attempt is happening, and the Secret Service get on the car, and they speed away past the grassy knoll, past the other assassin who never gets a shot at President Kennedy, and then President Kennedy's gone. And no one knows what to do, no one's quite sure what happens, and then, you know, later on, all of a sudden, while the assassin on the grassy knoll is probably trying to just figure out, okay, maybe what do I do now, the car with the president and his wife show up right down the road again, past the Texas School Book Depository, right to the grassy knoll where it proceeds to stall and stop. What are the odds of that? Kind of kooky, huh? History can be that way. Well, on June 28th, 1914, Gavrilo Princip, and from six to some sources say 20 assassins, if you believe some of the people who claim to have taken part in these assassination attempts, show up in Sarajevo with murder on their minds. They want to kill the, uh, the governing figure um, in Sarajevo, the person who is sort of the Prince Charles, plays the same role Prince Charles plays in the British monarchy right now, in the monarchy of the country that are the overlords in Sarajevo, a country that doesn't exist anymore called Austria-Hungary. And Austria-Hungary is led by a really old, very well-loved guy named Franz Joseph, who's going to die soon because he's very old. And the person who will take over when Franz Joseph dies is this guy coming on a visit to Sarajevo the Prince Charles of his country, although unlike Prince Charles, whose role is completely ceremonial, this guy will actually have some real power when he gets the throne. And for some, you know, now when you look back on it, it looks like a stupid reason. This guy, whose name is Archduke Franz Ferdinand, has decided to go to Sarajevo and watch military maneuvers, which happen to coincide with the anniversary of the most emotionally important, heart-wrenching you know, battlefield loss in all Serb history, the Battle of Kosovo, way back from hundreds and hundreds of years before this time period. Serb nationalists, and the Serbs are very, very patriotic even today, even more so back in 1914, look at this as a slap in the face. To them, Sarajevo is Slavic and should be part of at least a pan-Slavic country, or maybe part of Serbia. 
There had been Balkan wars for the last decade, you know, concerned with many of these nationalistic questions. Who should own these areas? And it had been in the hands of the Ottoman Turks, who the Slavs definitely feel shouldn't have been running the place. And it was transferred to the hands of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which the Serb nationalists still don't feel should be running the place. And now the Archduke was coming on the anniversary of this historic defeat, you know, from the Serb nationalist viewpoint, to rub their nose in the fact that Sarajevo is still held by a big non-Slavic empire. And they're going to make Franz Ferdinand pay for that. And in a remarkably similar situation to the Kennedy assassination, Ferdinand's route for his motorcade is published ahead of time. He's going to be arriving and going down the main boulevards in an open car with his wife sitting next to him. These multiple assassins line themselves up at various intervals along the parade route and plan to kill the Archduke as soon as they can. The Archduke's car is either going too fast or there are too many other Serbs in the crowd nearby the first few assassins, so the first few assassins don't try to make a run at him. Eventually, he passes one guy who runs out from the crowd with a bomb. Really more of a hand grenade would be a good way to describe it today. And he flings this hand grenade at the Archduke's open car. In a very athletic maneuver, the Archduke sees it, ducks behind the door of the car, the hand grenade thing bounces off the car, hits the concrete on the street, and the fuse doesn't detonate until the next car in the motorcade has passed over it. It explodes. Some 20 people are badly hurt, you know, blood on the street, the whole thing, chaos, the crowd scatters. I mean, obviously, you know, the parade is over. The would-be assassin shoves a cyanide pill into his mouth and runs down, you know, to the side of the street and jumps in the river. But the cyanide pill is defective and only makes him vomit. And the river is only about six inches deep. So they capture him very quickly and run him off to be interrogated. And basically, it looks like the whole day has been a failure. The other assassins, at least some of them, are supposed to have seen the Archduke's car speeding off. I mean, there you go. There goes the day. The motorcade goes in a couple of different directions. Some people are taken to the hospital. The Archduke and his wife, you know, go to the town hall to lodge a complaint. They were going to make a speech anyway, but now they have... An earful to give the local officials. We come to your town and this is the reception we get, that kind of thing. And it looks, at least from this point, like, you know, the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary just dodged a bullet, literally. There's some talk amongst the local officials about maybe figuring out a way to provide some increased security. But it doesn't seem to get very far because within an hour after the first attack, the Archduke and his wife and their small motorcade is... You know, off to the hospital, supposedly, you know, following an unplanned route for security reasons. There doesn't seem to be a lot of extra, you know, police protection. Uh, we're told that a, an aristocrat, Counts Franz von Herach, was on the running board of the Archduke's car, so maybe a little extra protection. It turns out, though, that the driver in one of those, you know, little screw-ups that affect the entire history of the world, turns out the driver of the Archduke's car did not realize they were not taking the original parade route and makes a wrong turn and ends up near a street corner where one of the assassins, Gavrilo Princep, maybe the guy on the grassy knoll with JFK, has stationed himself in the hopes that he might get a chance, you know, maybe just be in the right place when the Archduke had to come by again, perhaps on his way out of town. The Archduke's driver makes a wrong turn. He's told by somebody in the motorcade that he's made a wrong turn and that he has to back up. He stops the car in preparation for backing up right by where Gavrilo Princep is. Princep is on that street corner where the motorcade's car takes a wrong turn and then stops while backing up. And he sees his target from less than an hour before mere feet from him, immobile, and slightly below him, in an open car. And he whips out his pistol and shoots him, and his wife. What are the odds of that happening? It's considered to be one of the most wild coincidences in all human history. How many times do assassins in a failed assassination attempt get a second